Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the 2021 Oregon Active Transportation Summit. Um, my name is Lindsay Huber. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the Education Director with the Street Trust. Before we begin our program, the Street Trust would like to acknowledge the land we are occupying. The point. Uh oh, you, you're muted. Okay, we good now? Uh, the Street Trust would like. You're muted again. Why do I keep getting muted? You know why? Because I keep trying to mute myself and it mutes you. <laughs> That's I really think... weird. I won't I touch I it. Mute you. <laughs> it's Friday. There we go. Uh, the Street Trust would like to acknowledge the land we are occupying. The Portland metro area rests on traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Cathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapoya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia Rivers. We take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land. Thank you. Welcome to Your Ideas Wanted, coordinating Safe Routes to School statewide investments in education programs, construction projects, and student access to transit. Your presenters for this session are Leanne Ferguson, Heidi Manlove, and Maggie Charles. You can type your questions in the chat or use the raise hand tool, both found at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please use the social media hashtag Oats21 to post about the summit on social media. And don't forget to visit our website at thestreettrust.org to learn more about uh, our other programs and activities, including SB395, AKA Safe Routes for All, an update to the historic bike bill on its 50th anniversary that the Street Trust is championing in the Oregon legislature this session. To claim AICP credit for attending this session, please log into the OATS SCED platform and find the AICP certificate download link near the top of the page. Now, without further delay, please welcome to your screen, Leanne. Hi, everyone. Um... I'm going to share my screen with you. And pull my notes up here. All right, we're ready to go. So, hi, uh, my name is Leanne Ferguson. And I am here with some of my colleagues today to talk about Safe Routes to School and Transit. And we'll go ahead and introduce ourselves um, uh, uh, by uh, saying who we are and then how first we got into transportation options uh, type of work. So my name is Leanne Ferguson. I work for the uh, I work for the Oregon Department of Transportation as the Safe Routes to School Construction Program Manager. And I first got into sort of alternative forms of transportation. Um, there's sort of like two, two things. One was I moved to New York City and I could not afford a car anymore. And, uh, and even the Metro Pass was quite expensive. So in the summer, I rode my bike all over town because that was the cheapest way to go. And um, after that, I did a through hike of the Appalachian Trail and realized that walking was an actual way to get somewhere, which I'd never actually put together before. So uh, using walking as a form of transportation became really became really important. So between some of those um, some of those life life moves and life decisions, I got really into walking and biking and transit. Um, I'll pass it off to he uh, Heidi. Can you go next? Hi everyone, my name is Heidi. Um, I work at ODOT in the education program. Um, so I grew up in rural areas in Colorado and also uh, in Nevada. And so we had tons of fun growing up on bikes, um, but I never really learned or got comfortable um, commuting in the city because I grew up in a rural area. And so for me, um, uh, making sure that um, kids are comfortable um, and confident riders um, wherever they are going to and from school, but also around town um, is important to me. And um, as adults that will translate into um, a healthy adult behaviors where they're confident and safe road users. So that's ultimately um, my goal. And um, also too, in graduate school, I started working on a 
distracted driving intervention program and very soon uh, into the uh, literature review I started realizing um, just how much distracted driving and all sorts of other um, uh, road safety risks were incredibly um, risky for vulnerable road users and so that brought me to being um, an advocate for pedestrian and bicycle um, safety and start thinking about how um, my education and expertise in the field can um, work in um, communities and help to build um, strong growth in programs. So that's how I got started. How about you, Maggie? Hi, I'm Maggie. Um, I'm the formula program coordinator for the statewide transportation improvement fund. That's at ODOT um, within the public transportation division. And I feel like Heidi's was so thoughtful, um, her response to transportation. <laughs> But I think I would say that I first got into um, different modes of transportation living in Cincinnati because it's really hilly. And um, in college, I really liked to bike, but I did not want to bike uphill. So I learned how to put my bike on the front of the bus and realized that you can make different things work and you don't have to, I mean, you should push yourself, but you don't have to uh, make yourself too uncomfortable with it. There are options for you. So. Thank you. Um, uh, Lindsay, can you keep an eye on the waiting room? I'm, I'm thinking you're doing that, but I want to make sure that we don't miss any uh, letting anyone in. Yes, definitely. Great. Thanks. So the overview of our uh, collaborative collaboration presentation today and discussion will um, we'll be sharing a little bit about how we're collaborating sort of internally at ODOT across divisions and across departments and across modes. Um, we'll talk a little bit about our partnership with the Oregon Department of Education and uh, we'll do a couple a little bit of program highlights from each of the program manager uh, and then we'd like to have a discussion um, with you all on ways to collaborate between um, pedestrian and bicycle programs and transit. Um, basically, we're coming to sort of the, we're, we're coming to the realization that that our role as ODOT is to help provide those transportation options, whether it's walking, biking, transit, uh, um, all, sort of all the modes together, and that when we're all working together, is whenever we all reduce. Uh, congestion, reduce carbon emission, increase health and safety, like when we're all working together. So we've been, we've been, we've been on that ride together for the past couple of years in, in ODOT. So we'll start with a little bit of, of uh, grounding. What is Safe Routes to School? What is Oregon Safe Routes to School? We like to say in our community that it takes a village to get kids to school safely. So really it's um, it's a combination of the ODOT Safe Routes to School program, as well as transit and transportation options programs at ODOT, as well as all of those enthusiasts and practitioners around the state for Safe Routes to School, transportation options, um, all of those individuals, and then also all of our local entities, local and regional Safe Routes to School programs, uh, school districts, schools, all of those pieces together kind of pull together and make the Safe Routes to School program at, at, in, in Oregon. So for ODOT, what our role, what we see our role as being in this larger Safe Routes to School world as really providing safe, active, and shared transportation options. So we do that by investing in communities through grants and services. We prioritize underserved communities, uh, folks who don't have the, the resources or the capacity to do the, to do, to do the work on their own. And we build and leverage partnerships um, to, with agencies, schools, and community organizations to really create that, help create that village and bring us all together. And um, we're also committed to um, transparent communication and evaluation of our programs, which is also one reason why we're out here today talking about what's going on, how we're doing, how we're doing it, asking for feedback, really trying to take ideas and um, learn from our entire community. So our internal collaboration at ODOT in there, there's a thing called a work program. So uh, when I first got to ODOT and I was like, how do we, how do we formalize a collaboration? Um, the work program was, was the system that's set up to do that. So we've created a Safe Routes to School work program. And uh, we created it in 2018 when Heidi and I were brand new at ODOT coming together to bring the construction side of Safe Routes to School plus the education side of Safe Routes to School together. Um, Heidi and I both work in different divisions. 
at ODOT. Then in 2018, uh, we we uh, created we created this work program. We also included our transportation options colleague um, Stephanie Millar, who runs a program that funds uh, um, people to increase the number uh, or decrease the number of people commuting to large workplaces. So she she works to provide uh, different options for for commuters and for large um, larger companies to provide options for their for their employees. So our goals were to focus on funding allocation, collaboration, and equity on this work program. So one of the ways that uh, we started to implement the work program was in 2020. Heidi and I worked together to create a joint technical assistance. Um, uh, contract with one technical assistance provider so that our technical assistance from both programs could be pretty collaborative. Um, just uh, kind of by luck, we also happen to hire the same technical assistant that our that our transportation options work is is working through. So so we have some um, consistency around our technical assistance. It's in a, just an example of how we're how we're working through our work program to to bring our programs together and create a better program externally. So in 2020, we identified that transit needs to be more involved or needs to be another partner at the table. So we invited Maggie Charles and transit partner to our work program. And through that work program, um, we've been really on sort of like the very beginning end, uh, the very beginning parts of this collaboration. So we're in the, definitely in the learning stages and really just trying things out and see how it goes. So also in 2020, we created a strategic needs assessment for safe routes to school. And I'll go over a little bit of what that needs assessment um, has, has uh, taught us. So it was pulled together by our, our, our technical assistance team, which is Alta Commute Options, the Street Trust in Cogito. Um, the uh, technical assistance um, worked together um, to, uh, to get to our strategic needs assessment. So they conducted a bunch of out, outreach. They're starting to develop work plans for the technical assistance program, um, starting to implement those work plans. Uh, we're, and we finally, uh, finalized our strategic needs assessment actually in February and not in January. So the stakeholder outreach efforts is where we first started collaborating with our transit partners. Um, as, as part of this outreach, we reached out to um, the, some transit providers and some uh, the regional the RTCs, the regional transit coordinators that are also ODOT staff that work in the different ODOT regions. Um, moving from assessment to action, we decided to focus on these um, main topics, and you'll see there's a lot of parallels between this and the work program, um, which is great. So we got to get money out the door through funding and grants. There's a lot of internal ODOT collaboration that needs to happen to make it run smoothly. So that's where our, our transit partners really come into play. Um, also, external coordination and partnerships for Safe Routes to School is very important to create that, that village that we can all come together and help get our kids to school safely, as well as training materials and communications. One of the other things that we're um, implementing through this sort of combined technical assistance is the these ODOT Safe Routes to School regional hubs. So right now we have the ability to create three hubs, one around the Portland area, one sort of in our coastal um, regions uh, and then and then um, central and eastern Oregon all is one big um, all is one one big hub but our hope is that we that we will be able to create materials specific to like coastal communities specific to like rural rural communities and specific to sort of metro opportunities so uh, trying to help get resources out the door easier to more people. Um, and these regional hubs or these, yeah, these regional hubs can also work with transportation options practitioners around the state who also kind of have a surface area where they're working to increase the um, options for commuters. So there's some overlap that we can do with this hubs and other, and other resources that ODOT's kind of funding throughout. There's also going to be a big equity, or there is a big equity focus in our needs assessment, um, where we're, we're focused, some of the recommendations made through the needs assessment focus on trainings and webinars, a Spanish glossary, um, 
uh, equity uh, materials for each of those hubs and some evaluation, um, testing and updating the PED bike curriculum. Um, that's, that's a new resource of, uh, that's available as well as coordinate with climate change and youth leadership um, efforts around the state. So um, that's kind of an example of some of the outcomes that are coming from that internal collaborative work program. And that you're starting kind of to see where transit's being, um, being included in some, of those, in some of those partnerships and deliverables. The next sort of partnership I wanted to talk a little bit about where we're coordinating with transit is partnering with the Oregon Department of Education. Uh, in the past, we've had a very light touch with the Oregon Department of Education mostly around this one committee that, that, that we were on and they were on, but it wasn't focusing on that partnership at all. So currently we've moved towards um, a, a deeper partnership where we meet every other month and we collaborate on sharing communications, document reviews, curriculum and programming. Um, the folks who sit at those tables from the Department of Education, our pupil transportation, tribal attendance program and the Everyday Matters team as which is their chronic absenteeism team, as well as the physical education program and health and nutrition. So that's the ODE crowd that we get to sit with. And then on the ODOT side, it's uh, Safe Routes to School Education and Construction, plus transit partners, plus that transportation options, commuter style programs. And so we're all sitting together to really collaborate around how do we get kids to school safely. Um, with that, we'll, that's sort of our overview of our of our early collaboration ideas and implementing those. I'm going to pass it off to each program manager to talk a little bit more about their program specifically and then some of the areas where they see transit fitting in. So we'll go for Heidi. Hi again. Um, so uh, in terms of talking about transit, um, I'm first going to tell you some things that we do with transit, but then also um, lend some um, questions maybe to you guys or just what we're thinking in general of how we could better collaborate with transit. Um, so this Lookout for Kids is our um, current um, campaign. Um, you may have seen these on transit buses um, in the past few months, um, and this will be our current campaign for this year. Um, and so we're using this campaign to partner with different Safe Routes to School partners and spreading the message, but it helps to um, for people, for folks to think about um, kids being out um, at all different times during the day, um, especially because we have hybrid models with school and kids that aren't even going to school that are staying at home and being active. So um, it's incredibly important to keep that messaging going to remind folks that um, kids will be out playing at all different times of the day um, or commuting. So, so this is one thing that we use with transit to try to spread that message. Um, so uh, through through bus ads. Okay, next. Um, so in thinking about how um, the program is set up and what are some ways that we can um, partner with transit. We, our current funding split is um, between a competitive bucket and a statewide bucket. And so 60% of the funding for the education programming um, goes to local competitive grants where um, they compete for funds to have their own um, Safe Routes to School programming in their um, community. And so this could entail partnerships with um, um, transit districts and also um, two partnerships to encourage students to use um, transit um, when when possible. Um, also too with our statewide programming 40% of our funding goes with that and we do so much with our technical assistance team with this um, funding, um, producing education materials in partnership with ODE. Um, and then thinking about our encouragement and engagement programs like the walk and roll program. Um, and so <clears throat> in thinking about all of these different um, little touch points that we have um, in the program across the state, um, there are a lot of opportunities to, to um, use transit to partner with or encourage students to use. Next slide. So just a summary of our current uh, funding um, on the competitive side. 
Um, this past round, our past cycle, we're currently in the second year <clears throat> of the current cycle. So we have one more grant year and then we'll be opening up for applications uh, in uh, January, February of next year um, for the next cycle. But right now we have 11 grantees um, and this was way oversubscribed. The need is way more than what we have funding for. We had 28 applications and we're able to fund 11. And we had $4.4 million of ask and only had 2.3 million to allocate. So the, the great is need and, or the need is great. And um, so we're working to see how we can um, better utilize and synthesize some of our work as a statewide program to help give um, communities who do not have funding um, opportunities to still have some sort of safe routes to school education um, programming in their region. Next slide. So, um, so historically, we think about safe routes to school as being encouraging um, uh, uh, kids to uh, ride the bus, walk to school, roll to school um, on some form of whether it's bicycle or scooter, and less about and a focus to encourage families to not do the single family drop off for, for multiple reasons. Um, and so this works fairly well in areas where you have a safe routes to school coordinator and you have someone facilitating this and coordinating this as well as um, uh, you know, kids may be living closer to their schools, but um, what we've noticed with our partnership with ODE is um, transportation or lack thereof um, is one of the five indicators or reasons for um, the chronic um, absenteeism. And so in thinking about why that is, if they don't have a bus out to their region or can't get a ride in somewhere, um, they're not going to school. And so um, how can we um, possibly partner with transit to maybe bridge that um, gap or fulfill that need? And so thinking about um, suburb options or um, folks that live um, further out there that may not actually have access to a bus, a school bus or any kind of um, transportation otherwise. So just these are the kinds of things that we're thinking about in further collaborating and expanding our program. Next slide. So an example um, that we um, that I'm going to show you is one that Pbot has done for a while, and this is really um, this is an older version of their um, collaboration with Smart Trips, but um, just wanted to kind of highlight just some examples that programs um, uh, small or community programs could use um, where they. Uh, try to encourage um, kids and families to use public transit and um, to route to make their routes through the uses of um, public transit. And so right here on the left hand side of this card, you see there's like information that the um, kids and family can use to um, request um, for and then they send they would have sent the card in. So this is just a way to kind of pitch in some of the public transit information in with safe routes to school um, incentive programs. Next slide. And this is a newer program that Peabot is doing their recess program. And um, it's a neat program to get kids active and be thinking about physical activity and exercise. And they get some free prizes for joining and submitting their um, monthly tracker. And so on the left hand corner, you see they get the hop pass. So this is a way that you can um, um, you know, use transit in a way to encourage um, students and families to use it um, while also making it more of a transportation options program. So I think the back side of the card, the next slide, um, just shows them ways that they can do their tracking and, and monthly prizes, but you could maybe incorporate something to do with transit um, as part of that activity. So next slide. So we're, in summary, we're just looking to partner more with transit, more at a state level, uh, um, with collaborative, collaboratively with Leanne and I, but also um, trying to encourage um, coordinators and smaller community programs to also start thinking about how transit could play a role in helping kids get to school safely, but also to reduce the chronic absenteeism rates um, in the state. 
So ideas that I've mentioned are collaborating with partners like um, smart, smart Trips or expanding some resources, maybe um, interviewing folks at transit or trying to get some maps created for kids in the Safe Routes to School program um, and doing some kind of webinars and collaboration with transit, just ways that we can kind of pull in transit use in, in the programming. So these are just some ideas to put throw out there, but we're always wel we welcome your, any input that you guys may have or ideas or things that you've done in your own communities. That's it. Thanks, Heidi. So I'll talk a little bit about the Safe Routes to School construction program next um, and how we're working to, to incorporate more um, access in, in those programs. So um, the, the update on the construction program is that we were a, we've been able to fund 70 local construction projects and make about thir uh, write about 35 local Safe Routes to School plans with the Safe Routes to School funds so far. Uh, those funds were allocated by House Bill 2017, the Keep Oregon Moving Act, and thank you to anyone who participated in helping getting, uh, getting, getting that funding into that bill so that uh, we could um, have this great program now and be putting some projects on the ground. So that we were, we've been able to allocate $45 million in funds over the last couple of years, and but our funding requests have exceeded $160 million. So we know that we still Still, uh, there's still a great need out there, and we're trying to address it as we as we can with the funds that we can. Some of the highlights of the construction um, program and where we've um, interacted with transit a bit is the um, is really through the project identification program. So that is the picture that you see on the right, and that's where we can send our our technical assistant team to communities to work with the road authority. Uh, the city or the county or ODOT, whoever owns the road around that school, plus the school community to come up with a safe routes to school plan. So what we've implemented this year is really working with our regional transit coordinators in, in whatever region the community is in to bring our transit partners to the table as well, to be able to do holistic planning around how we're getting our kids to school, not just focusing on uh, barrier um, solutions um, to the walking and rolling barriers, but also to, um, to access to transit barriers, um, as well as those plans also cover address, uh, cover addressing barriers, uh, that can be, ugh, this is my, like, third presentation today, so I'm, like, really, like, uh, I'm stumbling a little bit, but also, the education side of the program is addressed in these plans as well. Like what education um, solutions can you have, education and engagement solutions can you have to the barriers to students getting to school? Um, some other just highlights of the program are, I've got uh, pictures of five of the projects that have actually been completed. Um, we're, we're coming up on, I think that our 10th project being completed since since the, first, the program first initiated in 2018. So I'm getting really excited about those completed projects and they're exactly what you expect them to be. They're, they're the bread and butter of our uh, ped bike system, uh, sidewalks, crossings. Uh, most of it, as you can see from the chart below, goes to improved crossings. Um, uh, we're, we're doing about over 440 crossing improvements with these funds. Uh, we're doing a bunch of curb ramps and access um, uh, projects as well, over 160. And there's over 120 new walkways that we're putting on, on the ground with these funds. Um, also lighting, um, school zone indicators as a couple of other um, bigger categories. But those, the main one is that crossing, like helping get kids get across the street. Looking ahead, we have some uh, a grant solicitation that Heidi mentioned coming up in early 2022, and we'll be soliciting applications for our education construction and the planning program, so that project identification program. Um, uh, we're really excited to see applications come in from all over the state and from hopefully from some of you that are on the presentation today. In order to um, uh, receive, the best way to stay up to date with these uh, programs is by signing up for our uh, gov delivery list is what we call it at ODOT, but it's basically like our, our, our ODOT listserv where we um, send out all the information around funding opportunities. That's our, that's our best way to send out information. Um, also, just a, an exciting update is there is actually a new $10 million for projects addressing barriers to students on state highways that was just allocated in the 2024 through 27 
statewide transportation improvement program. So there's more there's more funding coming down the line, and what that will mean is um, the is that ODOT won't need to compete for that um, safe routes to school pot of funding. Uh, so we can pull them out and and use this funds for them, and that will make more state funds available for local communities to build those safe routes to school projects. So we're excited to be able to fund more local communities in the next round. So in order to stay connected, in order to keep getting updates about these great um, opportunities and stay connected, please um, Google ODOT Safe Routes to School and sign up to receive email updates. That's the best way to be up to speed on our funding opportunities. Um, you can also Google uh, Oregon Safe Routes to School and it'll come up with the OregonSafeRoutes.org site, which is a great way to access other resources like training materials, curriculum, uh, videos, um, toolkits, online toolkits, and things of that nature. Um, and Stephanie Millar is unable to make it today for family reasons, so I'm going to talk a little bit about transportation options. Um, try not to ask me any questions about this at the end because I am not as up to speed um, on this. But um, so our transportation options program is the program that really works with uh, employers trying to help employees have options to get to school. And uh, the transportation options program has partners all around the, um, the state that have a service area that, that they can provide resources within that service area. One of the main resources that is used is the Get There Challenge. This really encourages people to try using different modes to get to work, um, really focusing around carpooling and transit. Um, but also, I think you can also track other modes of transportation in there as well. But the Get There Challenge is a great way to encourage um, uh, alternative uh, transportation options to get to work. Um, the 2021 challenge, some of the updates that have been added are this, um, these achievements. So it's kind of, it's a fun online app that you can use that gives you, that gives you the, that uh, shot of endorphins when someone tells you you've done a great job and gives you an award. Uh, so they have that built into this program. Um, and if you feel like, um, uh, if you are at a larger workplace and you're like, oh, this would be great. I would love all of the marketing materials for this so I can get my workplace on board. There are, um, there is ways to get the, the word out. There is a communications toolkit um, for this program that, uh, that can be shared and um, materials for social media and news releases and things like that. One way that the transportation options group uh, or program is collaborating with Safe Routes to School is um, one of the features of that um, online program, the Get There Challenge, is the school pool option. And this is sort of a closed system group that parents can, as, that are all a part of a school can make to help coordinate carpooling uh, to school. So we think that this is a great uh, potentially a great opportunity for schools, um, private schools and charter schools specifically that have kids coming from all over. They might um, have interest in using the school pool to coordinate to coordinate carpools, as well as some of the transportation options funds have been used to uh, provide a sponsorship to a school to create a maintenance uh, lab, a bike maintenance lab in their in their high school so that students can learn how to do bike maintenance and help get um, students to school by bike. So that's some ways that those transportation options funds have been used that's kind of like crossed into from, from sort of like that transit uh, commuter side uh, to the safe routes to school side. And I'll pass it to Maggie. Thank you. Um, I'm just remembering now though that I think there's a school pool webinar next Friday if anyone's interested. I know that I'm going to attend because I'm curious about it and know next to nothing. So just wanted I'll to find it and put the link in the, in the chat. Great idea. Great idea. Okay. Um, so if you want to move to the next slide, I will talk to everyone about the statewide transportation improvement fund program. I'm going to abbreviate it as the STIF program. It's just way easier to talk about it that way. Um, so the STIF program was established as part of the House Bill 2017 transportation funding package. Uh, we also call that package to keep Oregon moving funding package, so you may have heard of it that way. Um, it's a relatively new source of funding for improving, expanding, and maintaining transportation services in Oregon. 
Um, SIF funding comes from Oregon's transit tax, which is a state payroll tax is equal to one tenth of one percent. Um, and revenues from this source are allocated across four funds. So we have the formula program, which is my program, the one I'll be talking about today. We have the discretionary grant program, the inner community grant program, and then ODOT has a technical resource center that receives 1% of SIF funds. Um, so the formula fund receives the bulk of the funding, it's 90%. Um, and ODOT dis disperses those formula funds to max transit districts, max transportation districts, counties without either one of those districts, and the federally recognized Indian tribes. And it's all based on a formula allocation. So the total stiff formula funds we will distribute for 21-23 um, is uh, close to 188 million, 175,000. Those are recommended projects right now. They're going to be approved by the OTC um, May 15th, I think. So, but that's just a, a general estimate for you. If you want to go to the next slide, um, we'll talk a little bit more about what we fund with the SIP program. So um, let's see. So I mentioned the ultimate goal is to provide funding to improve, expand, and maintain public transportation services. But let's get into what that really means. Um, so the SIF funds may be used for public transportation purposes that support the effective planning, deployment, operation, and administration of public transportation programs. Um, there are seven criteria that we ask applicants to consider when they're selecting projects to fund using SIF dollars. So we would like to see projects that increase the frequency of bus service schedules in communities with a high percentage of low-income households. We'd like to see projects that expand bus routes and bus services to reach communities with a high percentage of low-income households. Projects that implement programs to reduce fares for public transportation in communities with a high percentage of low-income households. Um, we would like to see projects that procure buses that are powered by natural gas, electricity, or other low or no emission propulsion. Um, I'd like to see projects that improve the frequency and reliability of service connections between communities inside and outside of the qualified entities um, service area and qualified entity is just the direct recipient of the funds. We'd like to see projects that foster coordination between public transportation service providers to reduce fragmentation and then provision of transportation services. And lastly, the one most important for this group. We would like to see projects that provide student transportation services for students in grades 9 through 12. Um, so this criteria, we, we would like it to be 1% of funds that you receive through the SIF program each year. So if you're applying for funds, um, it's usually for a biennium. So each year of that biennium, we would like to see you allocate 1% of your total funding for the program, for programs that benefit student transportation. Um, so I have some project examples on the screen. People often allocate funds toward creating free or reduced bus fare programs for students, um, providing transportation to after school programs like to a boys and girls club, or um, I've seen in this last cycle, people spending money to um, transport students to like college or career fairs so that they can get more information about those options after school's over. Um, and also people, uh, fund programs that increase partnerships between the transit agencies in the school district so they can provide ongoing services and it just creates a sustainable relationship because they'll be getting the funding each biennium. So they'll go to them to talk about it. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about what is on the horizon for the SIF program. So First of all, we look forward to seeing what kind of student transportation projects can be actualized this year as COVID becomes hopefully less of a threat in the coming months. Um, I know that a lot of people didn't get around to implementing the projects that they had in the, in the 1921 biennium, which is also the first biennium of the program. So we don't have a lot of data about how successful it's been so far, um, but we look forward to seeing where the 21-23 projects go. And so starting July 1st, 2023, uh, my program, the SIF program, will be merged with our Special Transportation Fund program. And that fund provides transportation funding to seniors and people with disabilities of any age. So we're going to the rulemaking process right now for the new program. We've convened a rules advisory committee and we hope to draft the new program rules by the end of this year. So um, I have on the screen the SIF program website and then the consolidated SIF program website. You can look at both of those for more information about the regular SIF program. And then if you want to get updates about how the rulemaking process is going overall, 
we um, have a gov delivery, like Leanne mentioned, it's available on both of those websites. Um, I bring up the consolidation because the rules are where we wrote in the 1% um, allocation to student transportation fees. So we're now going through that process again and it may come up again. And um, we just wanna hear from people around the state and see what they want to funds to, to go toward what we want the priorities to be. So um, there are opportunities for you to get involved and make public comment. Um, so I encourage you to just take a look at our site and see if you'd like to get involved that way. Great, thank you. Um, before we move on to our discussion questions, there uh, a question came in for Maggie um, in the chat so, and um, says, Will there be any opportunity in the future to expand the eligibility for free or reduced transit passes to grade six through 12, as was the case in the state's first student transit pass program by Lane Transit District? It's a great question. I mean, as I mentioned, the rulemaking process, this is the time that we would be bringing that up as a possibility. Um, I know that people have allocated funds to, to projects that do benefit students younger than grades nine through 12. It's just not part of, um, like the outcomes that we're collecting to show the state, but funds are going towards students that are um, under grade nine. But um, yeah, I think there's more to come on that front. I think it's a great idea. And it's kind of what we're talking about in our work program meetings and just with a small group. So um, it's great. I encourage other people to bring up thoughts like that and I could share them with uh, my group back at those up too. Great, thank you. Um, so we have a couple of questions for you all. We realize that it's Friday afternoon. Um, so if, uh, if, if you need to like get up and jump for a minute, like please do it and get your, get your brain moving. We would love to ask you all, um, how can ODOT better coordinate between safe routes to school and transit externally? And how can you better coordinate active transportation and transit in your work? And what I'm thinking I might do is just put these questions in the chat so that everyone has them and then um, stop sharing my screen so that um, if you would like to share, uh, just turn your video on um, and let in and wave or let us know or just, uh, sorry, stop sharing, there we go. So the questions are how can ODOT better coordinate between safe routes and transit externally? Like if you've got like if you've got a vision for what it should look like, like now is a really good time to, to share that vision with us so that we can so that we can also get on board with your vision and see what we can do. Um, also, how can you better coordinate active transportation and transit in your work? Or what are some things that you're doing that you could share with the group that we can learn from each other and better coordinate our efforts? or I can play some music or something. Um, we've got a comment um, saying funding for permanent traffic gardens that function as a base for mobility education, including transit, walking, and biking. And gold star for anyone who can <laughs> tell me who wrote that comment, although you can all see who wrote it. It was our it was our um, our favorite Shane Rhodes, um, uh, Heidi or Maggie. Do any of you have anything to say about traffic gardens and funding? Yeah, um, for me, uh, some of the semi permanent traffic gardens um, things are um, stuff that we could uh, definitely um, pay for as part of the uh, local competitive grant projects. Um, it's the permanent part is what gets um, a little sticky. Um, so that would have to be um, something that we could definitely talk with in terms of our funding rules um, and see if that is a possibility. Um, if not, it might be something that um, could be worked in in a future ask of funding. So great. Um, that's great, Shane. And thank you for 
for mentioning that. Just curious if there are traffic garden examples that do incorporate uh, more of transit. Like I've, um, I don't know if I've ever paid attention to traffic gardens before and how and how transit's incorporated. So if anyone, Chain, if you've got any additional comments or. I'll, I'll just um, say, you know, the infrastructure, that's the, one of the issues is that the, um, because they're permanent, they're not programmatic side, but on the infrastructure side, they're not eligible because they're generally not in the right of way because they're in parks or, you know, some area that's not in the right of way. And so that's one of the issues that we've had in finding funding is sort of not fitting um, in in those realms. Um, but I think that there there definitely are some examples, some of the European examples of traffic gardens um, that have incorporated their scaled down city aspect and have had transit uh, incorporated in that with like mini bus stops um, in there and um, part of their education around you know all mobility um, was around transit for sure. Cool. Um, I wonder if there's a maybe, well, I know that the Safe Routes Infrastructure Funds is super narrow to the right of way, but I wonder if there's a, a like the new community paths program, if somehow it's like built into a path, like if that, if that's an opportunity, anyway, just sort of brainstorming. But. Um, Leah, did you have a comment? Yeah. Sure, yeah, I I had a kind of an idea that didn't come to fruition yet for, for our school district. So I'm a Safe Routes to School Coordinator for Beaverton School District. And we have a newcomer program um, in our district where these are students who've just arrived and have either a, a language barrier or some sort of trauma that allows them into this program where it's self-contained it's a year long program that they hopefully then graduate out of. But I thought of like a, a kind of a transportation training that would include transit, bike safety, provide them with bicycles um, and just kind of have the whole picture. And especially because these are kids who speak little to no English and maybe don't even read um, in their primary language that they would need a lot of assistance with, you know, like reading bus schedules and like, how do we get them those resources mm -hmm. in addition to just being in a new culture and how do you actually, like we all would get on a bus and like learn how to ride the bus and what would that look like? Um, so anyway, that, that's a dream of mine. <laughs> I love that dream. Maggie, do you have anything to add around the transit um, piece? Uh, well, just that I love that dream too. And I think um, we, we can fund mobility management projects using SIF dollars. So um, I'm not 100% sure what the boundaries are around that, but I know that travel training is one use of funds that people use pretty regularly. So um, yeah, I don't know why it couldn't be available to students too. It would just be, um, we'd want to consider those different aspects of the student life that you just mentioned and make sure that it's appropriate for them. But um, yeah, I think it's a great idea. That's definitely something I'll consider. Um, from the chat, um, there's, a, there's a couple of comments um, from Mary Jo about an uh, made, I think she's, you're talking about the traffic garden with the max line at the Gresham Sunrise Center. Correct. Awesome. I need to go out there and check that out. Um, and then uh, Chris- I tried to put a photo in the chat, but it won't stick. Oh, oh man, I'm bummed. Uh, we just said that we, when they, whenever we were setting this up, they're like, do you want to let people share your, their screens? And I was like, no, I can't think of why we would do that. And now I'm like, oh, we should have let you share your screen. I'm so sorry. Um, if you want to quickly email it to me, I can I can pop it up and share it. Um, and uh, Chris Wachi said uh, there could be some nice synergy with Safe Routes to School collaborating with transit in response to the pending statewide eco rule to remove parental barriers to use their own transportation options for the work commute. Um, Chris, do you want to say anything more about that? Uh, thanks, Leanne. I just realized it's a really long sentence. Um, I'm just, you know, with so much afoot right now, um, there's just some opportunities there, whether it's just simply 
using the conduit of safe routes and or, or transit and the TO providers reaching out to large employers is another way of reinforcing the message about safe routes to school. And so, so I think, and highlighting school pool and all the other things that are barriers um, that we have heard to parents letting their uh, kids use some other option rather than driving. So thanks. Yeah. Um, that's something that if Stephanie were here, she could talk a lot more about the eco rule. So um, thanks for bringing that up. And I apologize, I don't have a whole lot more to say about it. But I do think that there's great potential there. Or I know that it's very exciting that the eco rule is being expanded. Any other dreams, um, shared vision, want to share your visions? Um, Shane's also adding in the chat uh, another piece that they're working on in Eugene is expanding bike share access to high school students, at least bringing it down from 18 to 16. Um, that has been a barrier where bike share, you had to be 18 or older to use bike share. So um, Shane, if you want to share any more about how you're doing that, um, it might be something that others can learn from. Sure, just um, I'll note that we took over operations of Peace Health Rides, our bike share uh, internally with the city of Eugene, and then we uh, went through a process, an RFP process to bring on a new uh, operator and uh, Cascadia Mobility, who's working with ODOT on the potential of different statewide opportunities for bike share, uh, took over bike share uh, operations for us just this month. Um, and so we're working with them on, um, as they create their new policies and procedures that it's all set up uh, with some changes that we wanted to make in the system. And one of them was around access uh, and improving access for um, more people. And one of those was um, bringing the age down from 18 to 16, so. Awesome. There's actually a project in LTD's DIF plan. Um, DIF plan is like the application for our funding. And um, yeah, I think we're we're sending them some money to right. yeah, increase access. Yep, that's how, yeah, that's how we're able to do it, is through the state yeah. funding. So. <laughs> It's great to see these things actually. I actually like the it, it's happening on the um it's happening. But like having funds to make something happen is really helpful apparently. Um so this is the do you all see the screen of the picture that Mary Jo sent? Yep. All right. Thanks for sharing that. And where was that? This is in Gresham at the Sunrise Center, and it's right next to the Blue Line Max Tracks. And the community out there, this is in Rockwood neighborhood, and they have to navigate the Max Line. Uh, it cuts right through their community. So when we made this uh, traffic playground, uh, we want them to be able to learn how to use the Max and how to be careful on the Max Tracks when we get to be able to program at it. So we created um, this little uh, but this is the max stop <laughs> with a bench and the blue line max tracks are out there and um, so we're looking forward to doing more programming with it this summer. That's awesome. That's a great example of of including transit and how to how to go over the max tracks and how to get on and off the max. Great, right. Great example. Our, our other traffic playground also does include bus stops and you can see at the right side of the uh, yellow bus stop is the blue sign with the TriMet symbol on it. So mm -hmm. we did include bus stops in our other traffic gardens playgrounds as well. Very cool. Thanks. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, thanks for bringing these up, by the way. I'm so out of the school world that I had to Google transportation guard or traffic garden on the side here. And these are awesome. Um, the garden and the playground images are really cool it's stuff like in the piece of it. We have about four minutes left. Is there anyone else that has a vision or a, or a project that you're working on that you'd like to share? Any of our panelists want to say something? 
um, want to say something uh, as a, a, a in closing while folks are still thinking about if they want to have any more discussion topics. I think I would just say feel free to contact me if you have any questions about the types of projects this program can fund. It's still, you know, so new and um, pretty broad. We can fund anything, but if you can tie it to transit in some meaningful way, we will definitely consider it. So um, if you have some ideas that you think of later and you want to talk to me about it, I think you should have my contact information from the slide that we're providing. So um, feel free to do that. And if you have questions about the rulemaking process happening now, we want some like little side conversation about it instead of just getting the, the big email updates. Um, I'm happy to provide you with any information you might need to feel more comfortable and like you understand the programs better and the transit role within the safe office free world. Heidi, anything from your end? Just, um, I wanna thank everyone for being here today. I also wanna also um, put a little shout out for um, Walk and Roll to School Month um, in May and Walk and Roll to School Day, May 5th. Um, so we're into a really um, fun month in terms of activities for active transportation with kids and um, just bike month in general and bike safety month. So um, I appreciate all of you guys being here and um, we do welcome any um, ideas or feedback um, to incorporate transit um, at a statewide level um, in partnership with transit in any way. So um, any feedback you have that you didn't say in this meeting, please feel free to email me um, or call. Thank you. I think my closing words would be around, um, we realized that the eligibility for our grants at ODOT is pretty limited. Like for construction, you have to be, uh, you have to own a road. So, so not many of us have that. Um, on on uh, on Heidi's side, it's cities, counties, school districts, and nonprofits. And, and on the transit side with Maggie, it's mostly, um, it's transit districts. So it's already created, is that the right word for a transit district? Yeah, or counties, which are or, okay. as well, or federally recognized tribes. So yeah, they're established entities, and then you would apply for, for funding through them. So right. Yeah. So there's 42 eligible entities that get the the transit funds, and then most of those entities have a committee, I think, that help create the plan that's then submitted to ODOT so that that they can get the funds. So it says, oh, there's convoluted routes for how those funds get allocated and we really want to be as transparent as possible about who's getting the funds and how you as an individual could participate in whatever process is happening in order to have your have your voice heard so um thank you for coming today and being interested in collaborating more with transit and um and for spending your friday afternoon with us we really appreciate it Thank you so much, uh, Leanne, Heidi, and Maggie. Uh, thank you to our sponsors listed on the SCED conference website, and thank you for coming. Uh, so if you'd like to close out the 2021 Active Transportation Summit in style with Portland's most outrageous drag personality, uh, Poison Waters, then you can join us for a fun-filled hour of hilarity and hijinks as we play bingo starting right now. Just go back over to the SCED website and you can get the link. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>